Thank you. I wanted to give you a little bit of a background about our project and C-Nexus, North Carolina Newborn Exome Sequencing for Universal Screening. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ryan Paquin from um, RTI International who were uh, research partners with us in this study. So um, newborn screening, you've already heard about a, a bit about it. Um, we think of traditional newborn screening as the test that's done um, where they come in and uh, prick the heel of a newborn and, and put several spots of blood on a, on a piece of paper that's sent to the newborn screening lab. But there's also newborn screening that's done in every infant uh, born in the U.S. Uh, to test their hearing before they're discharged from the hospital as well as uh, most states are now screening for critical congenital heart disease by testing the um, pulse oximeter, or the amount of oxygen in a baby to pick up congenital heart defects. Uh, the recommended uniform screening panel that's recommended uh, uh, conditions that every state should include in their newborn screening program currently includes 35 core conditions. So the criteria uh, for deciding what would be uh, a condition that should be screened for uh, has been taken from criteria originally published by Wilson and Youngner in 1968. And it includes that there is a treatment available, that early treatment before symptoms appear is better, that the condition otherwise would not be identifiable in a newborn, so a test is required, and that you also need a rapid and inexpensive lab test uh, that's highly sensitive, no false negatives, and reasonably specific, few, if any, false positives. So now that we understand the genetic etiology of many Mendelian conditions, theoretically, uh, barriers to screening for any disorder in a newborn may now be overcome if there is a known genetic cause for a condition. But should we do this? And so that was really uh, one of the main uh, areas of interest for our project. Uh, the aims included to evaluate how next generation sequencing newborn screening, or what we call NGS, NBS, can extend the utility of current newborn screening, and to devise and evaluate a clinically oriented framework for analyzing information from next generation sequencing newborn screening, and to develop best practices for potentially incorporating this into clinical care. So um, we examined what information should be reported to parents. Do parents want this information? How do parents decide if they want this information? Do they agree with each other or not if they're a couple? And for our study, we utilized uh, cheek swabs or saliva samples from newborns uh, instead of the dried blood spot. And we looked at uh, Mendelian conditions, so uh, conditions that are known to have a genetic etiology, a single gene etiology, and broke it down into basically four different quadrants based on the, um, the age of an individual um, whether it had onset in infancy or childhood or adolescence or not until adulthood, and also whether or not we could treat the condition or could we screen for the condition uh, potentially if you knew, for example, that the, uh, a person was at risk for a tumor, let's say, a cancer. Could uh, there be a screening uh, option available? So uh, we broke that down into the, what's called the actionability of a condition. So um, in the upper left-hand corner is what we call our NGS, NBS category um, that includes conditions, many of which are currently on the recommended uniform screening panel uh, with onset in childhood and medical actionability. You can put a child on a special diet, you can give them a medication, um, et cetera. And then um, adult onset medically actionable conditions, such as conditions um, of causing uh, risk of breast and ovarian cancer or colon cancer. 
and then uh, conditions that would have onset in childhood, but for which there's no treatment, at least in the traditional sense, childhood onset, non-medically actionable. And finally, um, the fourth quadrant conditions with adult onset and non-medical actionability, for example, early onset Alzheimer disease. So we um, have uh, 466 conditions that were in our NGS, NBS category. And these were uh, analyzed and uh, returned um, if there were any uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in any of these uh, genes um, returned to all families whose children um, were in the study. And um, we base that uh, scoring system in order to determine which genes made it into that um, NGS, NBS category by looking at the severity of the outcome, the likelihood that there would be a severe outcome, how uh, effective was the intervention available, uh, what's the acceptability of families to um, having uh, this uh, condition known about and the intervention um, undertaken, and then what's the knowledge base for conditions. There's many conditions there where there may be just one um, publication uh, so that there's a little evidence that really this gene is associated with the condition. And then we had two different uh, cohort groups. Uh, we had one group uh, whose parents were uh, ascertained and recruited during their pregnancy, normal pregnancy. And then we had another whose children were diagnosed through traditional newborn screening and had uh, metabolic conditions um, or hearing loss. All uh, families of children in the diagnosed uh, cohort received diagnostic results related to the underlying condition. And then, as I said, everyone got back any findings in this NGS category. And then two-thirds of the families were randomized um, into a group we called the decision group, and they were able to receive additional information in other categories if they were interested. And those would include childhood onset, non-medically actionable conditions, adult onset, medically actionable, and then carrier status. Um, the category of adult onset non-medically actionable conditions were not reported to any participants. That was not an option. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ryan, and uh, we'll...